Good morning. It's Tuesday, November the 3rd, Election Day, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much. The prayer of the day comes from dailyscripture.net. Lord Jesus, your love never fails and your mercies abound. You offer us the best of gifts, peace, pardon, everlasting friendship with you at your banquet table. Fill me with gratitude for your great mercy and kindness towards me. And may I never fail to show kindness and mercy towards all I meet so that they may know the mercy and goodness you offer them as well. Amen. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. Who is the true conservative? He is the person that has the courage of his convictions and is confident in what he knows. He is the person that understands that culture trumps politics. He is not selfish, but minds his own business. He acts like an adult. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He's judgmental and moralizes. He refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He's open-minded, asking why, rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He is a normal American, and he is better than the socialist. He's a better friend, father, brother, family member, and a better person, period. Um, See, you you have to know that being a true conservative is best, or you're wasting your time. Additional examples of what it means to be a true conservative can be heard on the John and Ken Show on KFI AM 640 Monday through Friday from 2 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. So what happens in 2024? Assuming that um, Donald Trump gets elected, he's got an 85% chance of being reelected, as do all incumbents. But in 2024, it becomes an open seat. What happens to the country then? Uh, Who's going to fill the the vacuum? Who's going to fill the void? Um, Who is going to be draining the swamp in 2024? And the answer to that question is going to to be determined by our culture, uh, how our culture is shaped over the next four years. Are we going to be taking our culture and, and stopping its leftward drift and start moving it back into uh, more conservative direction, then we can look forward to having uh, better candidates, more Donald Trumps, Ronald Reagans, and John F. Kennedys, because we deserve to have good races. We deserve to have um, uh, good picks, people that um, are going to provide uh, something interesting and intellectually stimulating, uh, things to think about. Um, a, For instance, with Donald Trump, it would have been much better matchup if it had been Donald Trump and Bernie Saunders. I'm a, I'm a Donald Trump guy. I'm a con- true conservative, and uh, Donald Trump uh, is, is uh, as close to true conservative as I'm going to get in, in a politician. And so I'm no big fan of uh, uh, Bernie Saunders. As a matter of fact, I'm an anti-fan. I don't like him. I don't like his so-called ideas, which are really nothing. They're just tools and techniques. But uh, the point is that if you're going to have a debate, I, I'd rather much, much rather watch Donald Trump and Bernie Saunders have a debate than Joe Biden. Uh, who can barely figure out what day it is. So um, that's the, the whole idea is we want good candidates. We want to have uh, be able to, to sit down and uh, make the, the choice a little bit on the tough side. You know, who am I going to uh, vote for? Uh, John F. Kennedy is about the only um, Democrat I can think of that I would have voted for other than uh, a congressman named Zell Miller. Zell Miller I would have voted for also. But uh, right now, there, we're, what we're looking at really is on uh, ending up voting. Um, the choice will be between AOC, the Democrat AOC, and the Republican version of AOC. That's the way things are shaping up. The Republican Party is going farther and farther and farther to the left and uh, is becoming more unrecognizable from a Republican or conservative standpoint. And so what we're going to end up with is then... Uh, two basically two AOCs, one with a D after their name and one with an R. That's not a choice. That's not a debate. That's um, unacceptable. 
So, but uh, that's where you and I come in, and this part, what the podcast is about, shaping our culture. Uh, there's a book out called Reclaiming Our uh, Culture and uh, by Anthony Esselin, and it's an excellent book, and in it, he's making the point that in order to reshape our culture or reclaim our culture, we have to reclaim truth. In order to do that, we have to reclaim language. So uh, you and I need to do that. We need to be good, true conservatives, and uh, if we can do that, then we can influence those around us, our family and friends, to do likewise, to be good conservatives, and uh, then we are going to create a culture in which we can have the kind of candidates that we deserve. So um, uh, my podcast is short. It uh, runs anywhere from 5 to about 30 minutes long uh, because uh, shorter podcasts are easier to um, download and listen to. Everybody can find five, 5 to 30 minutes in their schedule to uh, listen to a podcast. Whereas if you've got most podcasts, you're looking at an hour, two hours, three hours. Uh, even if I want to download all that, then uh, I'm still looking at a question of uh, where am I going to find the time to sit down and listen to it. So... Um, my uh, biggest sociopolitical influences are my parents, my teachers, Sir Francis Bacon, John Locke, Sir Isaac Newton, Ayn Rand, and Dr. Mortimer Adler. I also got to say uh, from the time I was a teenager that actually some of my biggest uh, sociopolitical influences were the left. Uh, radio stations like uh, KMET and KLOS, which were uh, rock stations, and uh, so those were also some pretty big influences um, in in my life. But I'm over intellectually speaking. I would say it's uh, Bacon, Locke, Newton, Rand, and Adler. So, uh, anyways, my podcast is made available through Spreaker and can be hide, heard on iTunes, Spotify, Google, and YouTube. And also, I want to let people know if uh, you have some type of a shout out you would like me to do, a friend that you'd like me to acknowledge, uh, somebody's birthday anniversary, or perhaps even somebody's going through some difficulties and you'd like me to say a prayer for them on my podcast, uh, please go to YouTube, look up my um, podcast on YouTube, and uh, put it in the comments section. And I'll be sure to get it. So today, where do we stand? Quote of the day, conservative vocabulary, how to win, good news, bring back, right or wrong, conservative aphorisms, and socialist vocabulary. All that when I come back. Thank you very much. The biggest problem with the news besides undeclared bias and the fact that it's for profit is the lack of continuity. Uh, I decide to take issues facing the country and report on them until a story is complete so we get a sense of continuity. Hence, this section called Where Do We Stand? Today is Election Day. No news on the monster that's been arraigned for shooting two Los Angeles sheriff's deputies. George Soros still is not dead yet. No law enforcement union has yet been decertified, and no laws shielding officers from prosecution have yet been repealed. The so-called Patriot Act is still the law of the land. New York Times v. Sullivan continues to encourage news people to be super citizens and, um, let's see, and defame people at will without having to fear uh, the consequences. Where's the expose on the Washington press corps? Where's nonprofit news? Jill Biden is still the ugliest woman in America for encouraging her feeble husband's campaign. The communist flu continues. Blue Cross and Kaiser Permanente continue to uh, take advantage of the lockdown, collecting our premiums while they avoid paying claims. Governor Newsom has enacted a a racist scheme to keep Californians locked down indefinitely. Negotiations on the communist flu relief bill are stalled because Nancy Pelosi wants to include all kinds of irrelevant provisions. When I come back, conservative vocabulary. Thank you. Uh, there's more to being a true conservative than how you vote. It's not you, you can do more than have an effect once every two years. You're going to affect each and every day. And one of the ways you can do that is the way you talk, the way you communicate. Hence, conservative vocabulary. Words like no, 
Uh, those are word, that's a word you're not going to hear in the lefties vocabulary. Uh, they're loath to say no. Go back. The lefties always saying uh, going forward, going forward, going forward. It's like, again, a brainwashing type of technique. Uh, mind your own business. The, the lefties do actually uh, respect this to a certain degree, but they call it staying in your lane. Right and wrong. Should. They absolutely abhor the word should. Good, bad, evil, reality, certainty, morality, beauty, and polity. And of those, certainty is the worst. They cannot stand. People will challenge you any time you make a statement of certainty. This is the way it is. Uh, then there, there's going to be somebody there that's going to challenge you, with a usually with a what about question. What about this? What about that? And uh, you end up getting hounded. If you don't know what you're doing and how to respond to it, you'll get hounded until the point where you don't bother to speak with certainty anymore. You'll always approximate. You'll always say, in my opinion. You'll qualify your statements constantly. And you can't do that and expect to win. So um, these are the, those are the terms that uh, the left doesn't want to use because they're realistic. So how to win? Follow or the how to win actually today? How to win? Vote. And we'll just leave it at that. Quote of the day. The reason that men enter into society is the preservation of their property. John Locke. And why do people have property? To preserve and uh, their privacy. Because people have reasonable expectations of privacy. Every other talk show on the radio spends all of its time grinding its audience with negatives and bad news. This is uh, demoralizing, and the reason that I want to make sure I include good news. And the good news today is the gross domestic product of the United States is up 33.1%. President Trump has solidified another peace treaty between Sudan and Israel. And uh, that's a thumb in the eye to John Kerry, who said that this was impossible there was no way we were going to have Middle East peace without going through the Palestinians, without getting their permission first, basically. President Trump was nominated three times for a Nobel Peace Prize. And again, don't believe in the polls. The only for purpose for the polls is to shape reality, to project rather than to reflect, to psychologically demoralize you. The only relevant statistic is that incumbents win re-election 85% of the time. Also, that the incumbents are only lately over the past 30 or 40 years out of office because they end up with a third party challenger. Uh, George H.W. Bush in uh, 1992 didn't lose to Bill Clinton, he, he lost to Ross Perot. And uh, it was in uh, the year 2000 uh, that Al Gore did not lose to George W. Bush, he lost to Ralph Nader. If it hadn't been for Ralph Nader, he, uh, Ralph Nader si siphoned off enough votes, Democrat votes, from, um, from uh, Al Gore to give the race to Bush. Otherwise, Al Gore would have ended up being president. So, And in this particular case, there really is no third-party candidate. I mean, you've got the libertarians and whatnot, but usually they, they only attract libertarians. Uh, they're not going to siphon off any Republican votes. The only one that could be even remotely considered a challenger would be Kanye West. And we know why that isn't going to happen. So um, let me see. Um, President Trump's judicial picks are beginning to have an effect. You know, where there's always the talk about the, the president's power to nominate a judicial, um, you know, uh, Supreme Court judges or Supreme Court justices and also um, circuit court uh, judges as well. And uh, it's easy to overlook that or to think that it isn't that big of a deal, but you'll see it in rulings, and we're beginning to see it immediately in that uh, the Ninth Circuit of all the circuits, it's amazing that the Ninth Circuit is now, uh, has now um, actually uh, shot down a gun control measure. They basically they went ahead and shot that down. So um, there, his picks are beginning to have an effect. So um, let's see... Uh, attorney, the Attorney General Barr and Senator Lindsey Graham continue uh, an investigation into the treacherous behavior of former FBI Director Comey and his henchmen. Uh, I don't expect that there's going to be much news on this until after the election. Uh, let's see. The mayor of Los Angeles and the LAPD show respect for property rights and the rule of law for once by announcing dozens of arrests and ongoing pursuit of suspects from summer rioting. Also, as a side note, uh, 
the uh, mayor has announced and the LAPD has announced that they're gearing up for this election, that if there's, uh, they've got new riot shields and whatnot, and that they're really, really not going to put up with any, uh, the, the amount of crap they put up with last time. It's going to be, uh, if you're out there trying to, you're going to be arrested. They said it flat out. If you're out uh, trying to destroy buildings, destroy property, et cetera, um, vandalizing, et cetera, you'll be arrested. There's not going to be any standing down nonsense. Uh, so uh, good to hear that. We'll see how well that actually plays out. Or hopefully we won't have to see uh, how well that's going to play out. Hopefully this is just a bluff on the part of the left. The state of Florida has the courage to lift all coronavirus restrictions and businesses and schools are reopening. Hooray for the governor of Florida. Grocery store shelves are full again, meaning that things are getting back to normal. Real normal. Not new normal. Not anarchist normal. Uh, and God bless Rush Limbaugh, and may he be behind the golden EIB microphone for many years to come. As conservatives, one of the rules of being a true conservative is making the presumption for the status quo. We ask ourselves, what's wrong with the thing, way things are? When somebody comes along and says, hey, let's change, let's do something new, we ask ourselves, why? What's wrong with the way things are? And we change when there's an obvious or prima facie case for change. Slavery, Jim Crow are two examples of that. Um, but there's a lot of things that we've, changes that we've made that are gratuitous. Uh, the legalization of the recreational use of marijuana wasn't done because we were convinced or persuaded intellectually that that was what's best for the country or, or the best for the state, actually, because it's not a country uh, thing. It's eight states that have, have gone ahead and uh, legalized uh, marijuana. So, but it wasn't because the Californians as a whole um, have uh, decided that this is what's best for the state. They just got sick and tired of listening to people going on and on and on, whining and complaining and using various psychological tools and tactics like prove a negative uh, to get their point across. So they just eventually give up and vote for it. It was like uh, John uh, Cobalt on the John and Ken show who said, um, Go ahead and vote for the legalization of marijuana. It's inevitable. And that's what the left likes to do. Create so much pressure that you, you become brainwashed into believing that whatever it is they want is inevitable. So you may as well just give up and do it. Don't. Um, so, and this, that's why we have, there's a list of ideas that I've got, concept, concepts and abstractions that shouldn't have been changed and, uh, or left by the wayside, and they should be brought back, such as privacy. Um, right this morning, a classic example of uh, lack of privacy, Hugh Hewitt was um, uh, uh, talking to his, almost the whole show was devoted to his guests and um, get, finding out whether or not they have voted and asking them flat out, who did you vote for? It's none of your damn business. Whether or not I voted is no, nobody's business. Who I voted for is nobody's business. It's called a secret ballot for a reason. And, but it's, it's interesting that so many people are willing to answer that question. It's one of life's little murders. Don't participate. If you're a true conservative, you maintain your privacy. Because once you give it up, tooth problems. Number one, whatever it is that you, you've, like, if you say, oh, well, I voted for Donald Trump, you can't take that back now. You can't say, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I want my privacy back. Pretend you didn't hear me saying that I voted for Donald Trump. Too late. Second thing is you set a precedent. If you're willing to go ahead and tell me about who you voted for, you're willing to tell me the color of your underwear. You're willing to tell me about the sexual positions you and your wife engage in. Okay, don't, don't put yourself in that position. Maintain your privacy unless you've got a damn good reason not to. So uh, bring back, and privacy is, again, the, the foundation of property rights. We have property and property rights because we have a reasonable or a uh, yeah, reasonable expectation, not a right, but an expectation of privacy. So uh, bring back the pre-1970 filibuster. Bring back outlawry, single-income households, integration, parenting, and along with it, corporal punishment, the primacy of existence, certainty of knowledge, and universal rights and wrongs. Bring back principled behavior, masculinity and femininity, Adam 12, John F. Kennedy, the gold standard, pre-HMO medical care, nonprofit news, civil service, the term stupid question, arguments and fights, 
the cultural influence of the church and the Boy Scouts, bring back the influence of social organizations such as the Lions Club and the Rotary Club, bring back bowling and bowling leagues, bring back smart. So um, now we're at the right or wrong uh, section or, or segment of my podcast here. And uh, the following is going to be a seven-minute, a little over seven-minute clip of Mo Kelly from his uh, show on Sunday. Mo Kelly is a talk show host who's uh, rather opportunistic and se- sensationalistic. So whatever he says should be taken with a, a grain of salt. But uh, he's engaged in this particular clip with um, fallacious reasoning. And uh, as it w- in any fallacy, they are statements that at first blush seem true, but when you think about them, you realize that they're false. So I'm going to play the clip, and then I'm going to go ahead and um, point out where he went wrong. Here we go. AM 640, this is the Mo Kelly Show. Remember when you were a kid and your parents would tell you the sooner you clean your room, the sooner you could go out and play. And I'm not talking to anyone under the age of 25 right now. You didn't go outside and play with your friends in the neighborhood like my generation did, okay? But that was the carrot. Clean your room, do your chores, then you could have fun with your friends. Those were the expectations. And if you were like me, you probably procrastinated or you did things half-assed. I know I did. I would push dirty clothes under the bed or into the closet, stuffing clean clothes into drawers without properly folding them. And then I'd try to bolt outside as if my mother wouldn't notice. And she would, you know, take one look at the room and, and obviously realize it was unclean and call me right back. At this point, not only have I wasted precious time undermining myself, In throwing clothes in the closet and under the bed, I now have to undo what I've done to get back to the beginning and start over. It's now going to take me longer to get the original task done. And I'm keeping myself away from what I would rather do even longer. It's bad all the way around. That is how I would characterize our response to COVID-19. Our as in the United States. Our as in California. We don't want to wear masks. We don't want to social distance. We want to have mansion parties. We want to have big wedding parties. We want to celebrate the Lakers and Dodgers in the streets. We want to complain about how our kids should be in school and Disneyland should be open. We want to have rallies of some 30,000 people daily just to cheer on the president. And for that, here and similarly around the country, we are working our way backwards. Deaths are up to 1,000 per day, and we are up to 100,000 new COVID diagnoses in one day. A new record, and it's not just more testing. Hospitalizations are up, and many areas around the country are at capacity, and it's not even November yet, meaning the worst is on the way. Deaths are up, hospitalizations are up, diagnoses are up. Happy Halloween. So what does it mean? It means we're likely going to be sent back to our rooms again. And we'll probably have to stay there until we get it right. Remember how we were about mm, five to six weeks behind Europe the first time around? Well, we're still behind them about five to six weeks. And we can use Europe as our canary in the coal mine. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson indicated today that the country was going to go into its second lockdown. In France, until December 1st, residents will only be allowed to leave their homes to buy essential goods for medical reasons and to exercise for an hour a day. It sounds like a penitentiary. Germany will impose a partial lockdown from November 2nd, which will last for four weeks. Belgium has imposed a partial lockdown. Non-essential shops have been shut and businesses that require close contact, you know, like hairdressers, salons, gyms, pools, and other culture and leisure facilities are also closed. Beyond their home, gatherings will be limited to a maximum of four people. That's Belgium. Italy, new restrictions were introduced on October 26th and will remain in place for a month. All bars and restaurants have to close by 6 p.m. Schools and workplaces remain open. But gyms, swimming pools, theaters, all closed. Greece, they shut down restaurants, bars, cafes, cinemas, and gyms across a large part of the country. Spain declared a state of emergency and began a nationwide curfew, which runs from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. That was on October 25th. 
Meetings of more than six are banned across the country. People are only allowed to make a journey if going to work, buying medicine, or caring for someone. Ireland was the first European country to return to a nationwide shutdown, and that was back on October 20th. Non-essential retail businesses were ordered to close. Residents required to stay within three miles of their homes, except for work and other essential activities. They expect in Ireland 150,000 job losses. And still did it. Because for them, the health crisis had to be handled before the economic one could. Every single country I just mentioned has a lower, hear me, lower COVID infection rate and lower COVID death rate per capita than the U.S. So what does the European canary in the coal mine tell us once again as we complain about Disneyland not being open? It means we will be sent back to our rooms again until we get this right because we wanted to shove clothes under the bed instead of wearing masks and social distancing. We wanted to go to SoFi Stadium. We'll have to start all over again, but from a worse position. Higher infections than ever. But hey, this is all some Democrat hoax, and you don't want to wear a mask, right? Which means everything we've done up to now means pretty much mm, nothing. Because we're worse off now than when we started, and we have nothing to show for it. You know how your parents will tell you, you're not leaving that table until you clean your plate? And you start just pushing food around the plate, thinking that if enough time passes, they'll let you go? No, it doesn't work that way. There's no escaping it. We're going to have to clean our plate. We're going to have to clean our room. There is no getting around it. We're worse off than when we started and have nothing to show for it. Grand opening, grand closing. Remember what I said about needing to get this right the first time so we wouldn't have to do it a second time? Well, how about a third helping of lockdowns, going back to that whole clean your plate analogy? Not the diet kind of lockdowns, but the real Italy, France, Belgium, hardcore kind. Trust me, Belgium, Greece, Great Britain, France, Ireland do not care about American politics. They do not care about Democrats. They don't care about Nancy Pelosi, Gavin Newsom, or that we are divided politically here regarding COVID-19. They don't give a damn. This world is so much bigger than your pet local Facebook political discussions. This is happening 100,000 new infections in the United States in one day, and it's not even November. But for those who only see this in red and blue political terms, I got something for you. Of the top 10 states with the highest number of COVID infections for October, nine of them are red, one is blue, and eight are presidential election battleground states. Did you hear me? Nine are red, one is blue, and eight are presidential election battleground states. Those same states will also become the leaders in hospitalizations and deaths. How do I know? Because math and lagging indicators, that's how they work. Economically, the stock market has responded to the worldwide lockdowns in this way, down 2,300 points since October 12th. But hey, it'll all be fine because you're not cheap. And it's just a Democrat hoax. Your kids will be back in school by January 1, and all this will be behind us by Memorial Day, just like the vice president told us. Except he just forgot to say Memorial Day 2022. Clean up your room, and then you can go play outside. But speaking of the stock market, I've got some thoughts on what else it may mean as we prepare for Election Day. That's next. This is the Mo Kelly Show, KFI AM 640, live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Now Claudette Stefanian has the news. Well, Mr. Kelly, the rest of us have, were children, too, and we learned a few things as well. Uh, one of the things we learned was to mind our own business. We were told by our parents, our teachers, and other students to mind your own business. When we tattletailed, our mothers would rebuke us, send us to our rooms, or even give us a well-deserved whooping. So the real lesson from childhood is stay in your lane. Our parents also taught us to knock it off with superstitious nonsense. We came home with all kinds of crazy ideas, and our parents were there to set us straight. And our parents are still here to remind us that wearing a mask is no protection against anything. If it were, then the Europeans wouldn't be suffering another lockdown. Either masks and lockdowns are effective in fighting the communist flu, or they are not. Evidently, not. Be of good cheer. The universe is benevolent. Success is to be expected. The left has no authority, no power, and they can't win. 
Think about it. Conservative aphorisms. These are words and phrases they think will make excellent bumper stickers. Why? Who asked you? Who cares? Who is we? Are you sure? How do you know? No, you don't understand. No, you're not listening. You're right. I don't care. No, you're not a leader or a change agent. Who died and left you in charge? Who told you that? And my personal favorite, get off of my lawn. Next up, uh, let's see, is uh, socialist vocabulary. Thank you. Uh, since nobody wears uniforms, how do you identify the socialists in your midst? By their vocabulary, how they speak. Socialist vocabulary includes such words as stakeholders, Latin X, empower, going forward, mansplaining, politically correct, supportive, hegemony, organic, grassroots, code word, dog whistle, and the masses. Who is the socialist? He's the man that seeks consensus rather than develop his own opinions. He is subjective, petty, and small, taking everything in life personally. He's outrageous, boring, and rude. He pretends to be a leader and a change agent. He is manipulative. He's sly, cunning, and deceptive. He dresses, acts, and speaks like a slob. He's informal and terminally unique. He's childish and pretends that he knows nothing. He's pragmatic and ignores his conscience. He acts randomly and rationalizes his behavior. Deterministic, blaming others for his mistakes. Skeptical, demanding that others solve his problems. His unreasonableness and irresponsibility make him a bad role model, a bad father, brother, family member, friend, and a bad person, period. So if you think that you should be friends with a socialist, think again. On the next episode, how to think about justice. Actually, on the next episode, which was uh, I'm planning for tomorrow, celebrate. Celebration. And that concludes another episode of The Drill. Be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and always ask yourself, what is real, how do I know, and what should I do about it? I'm Ron, and that's The Drill. <laughs>